Good evening. This is uh, Kai Hagen with Eye on Our Community. We're going to have an interesting discussion today about planning and development and smart growth, what it is and what it isn't. But uh, first, I just wanted to take a moment to uh, share an announcement. If you haven't heard it already, I think we said something about it last time. Uh, this show, which has been a weekly pre-recorded uh, show, so it's not been a live show. It hasn't been a show that has uh, callers or anything like that. It's going to be morphing or switching over starting Monday to a daily show, one hour live with callers and a variety of guests. The focus will still be the same focusing on issues, events, and people in Frederick County, but we're going to be engaging more with you. Uh, we'll probably bounce around subjects a little bit more frequently in some shows, and after some weeks of uh, getting uh, used to that, we're talking about going to two hours a day. So that'll be drive time, five to six at first, five to seven at first, and as always, it'll be available for you to listen to online. And uh, I guess before too long, we'll also be able to stream it live, so you'll be able to listen to it live if you want to participate or call in, uh, you know, through your phone or your laptop or whatever. So on to today's show. Uh, this evening, I've got two guests with me. Uh, this should be a very interesting discussion. Uh, I don't know if 42 minutes is going to be enough to uh, cover this subject, but we're going to give it a shot. Um, first of all, I've got uh, Jim James or Jim yeah. Noonan with me. Uh, his bio is a little extensive, but it's worth sharing some of the details with you. Uh, he's the director of planning at Strawn Environment. And he has 40 years of planning experience with in the public sector and the private sector, including environmental and planning policy development, environmental assessments for the state of Maryland, etc. He's uh, got extensive experience in NEPA compliance, environmental assessments, permitting and zoning requirements. And before he joined uh, the current company that he works with, with. Uh, Mr. Noonan worked for the state of Maryland for many years, and while at the Maryland Department of Planning, he was the director of infrastructure planning, uh, where I bet that made you real popular. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> uh, he was the director of local planning assistance, when he supervised, where he supervised the staff of up to 20 planners uh, who worked to provide input on local issues and assisted small governments in preparing local comprehensive plans, zoning, subdivision ordinance, because a lot of these communities don't really really have the staffing and the resources to do that well. For example, here in Frederick County, the county often helps with some of the smaller municipalities. Uh, but uh, uh, he's worked with Smart Growth Implementation, uh, the Intercounty Connector, Principles Plus One Committee, the Chesapeake Bay Restoration Task Force, and the Land Growth and Stewardship Subcommittee of the Chesapeake Bay Program. So that's a very impressive resume, and he is, uh, on top of that, the past vice president and currently serves as a treasurer for the American Planning Association, the Maryland chapter. It's a national organization. So we also have with us Matt Edens. Uh, Matt uh, is probably a little more familiar to some of you folks in this area. If you read the Frederick News Post or Frederick Guerrilla Magazine, he's been studying and writing uh, about land use issues for uh, a long time now, and he has a regular column with the Frederick News Post in which he often writes about just these issues. And uh, another one entitled Developmental, uh, that's with a capital um, M-E-N-T-A-L, that's uh, usually towards the back of the Frederick Gorilla Magazine, and uh, most of the time those are exactly the same you know, range of, of subjects. I encourage you to find them there. You can read them online, uh, both of them, both the Frederick News Post columns and the uh, Frederick Gorilla uh, columns are available online. And those generally are about specific local issues, but with a perspective that uh, looks at it from a sort of a broader uh, point of view. And so very happy to have both of those uh, these folks with us today and uh, take a moment. I know I've already said a lot about you, but if you would like, besides if there's anything you'd like to add to that, uh, welcome, Jim. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, Ben. Um, I don't have too much to add, <laughs> with, frankly. Thank you very much for the introduction. My pleasure, and thank you for taking the trip up here from Ellicott City. Uh, so what I thought we could do at first 
for this first segment is talk a little bit about the misconceptions and preconceptions that people have about smart growth. Because that's one of those terms, and there are a lot of things like that, where everybody has some sense of what it is. It's not an unfamiliar term to people. It hasn't been around forever, but most people have heard it, certainly. Uh, it certainly gets bandied about a lot in development discussions and development battles and uh, around controversial issues in Frederick County over the last few years. Uh, it means different things to different people in part because the truth is it's a complicated combination of of, of numerous principles and goals uh, that may never be all per- to put together perfectly, but it seems that most people tend to think of it as increasing density, uh, maybe having taller buildings, uh, perhaps uh, uh, trying to put uh, more development where there is existing infrastructure, uh, but it's really more than that. Um, I know, uh, Matt, one of the uh, time ways in which that has sort of come up with you as a source of some uh, frustration uh, was in this whole battle over the Monrovia Town Center and some of the other developments here and the way that people uh, sort of focused on what was good or bad about it. Um, what are your thoughts on just the way in which people currently tend to think of smart growth and and uh, I, I'm interested in how we can get people to think a little bit more broadly about it and that's what we're going to be talking about today but well I guess um, I guess yeah, a lot of it, like you say it's kind of a it's one of those terms where people don't necessarily understand what it means but it's the kind of thing you can say that can It can mean a whole lot of things, but I think in a lot of cases, particularly when it comes up in uh, in growth debates, it gets kind of spun one way or the other. Like uh, like with Monrovia, the uh, the fact that what what they were proposing was relatively dense compared to the surrounding area. The the developers spun that as it is smart growth, and then the opponents. didn't you know said it said it wasn't although and I'd say they were right but not necessarily sometimes for the right reasons I think sometimes uh, you know I think sometimes a lot of folks you know smart growth is is a way to say build it over you know build it over there not over here you know (laughs) I think that's an interesting point in that really both sides are using a view of smart growth to advocate their particular point of view in a complicated Mm -hmm battle which has a lot of different elements at play and i think your 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 question about how do you define it i mean it's often the the smart growth is in the eye of the beholder just like beauty is i guess (laughs) um and and it's a little bit more confused in maryland because maryland in addition to dealing with um the issues the national issues surrounding about what smart growth should be and how you define it has a smart growth program which is a little bit different as well. It's more a question of how the state government interacts with local government and what kind of uh, what kind of growth and development the state government is going to support over time. I, I think if you go back to the core of smart growth, it's it's all about, you know, how are we going to live in the future? What's the most it has elements of a community design, hopefully, not just density. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have to make it look good and make it live, make people want to live in these communities. So high rises isn't necessarily um, what we're talking about. Uh, but you also have an element of public infrastructure on the efficient use of taxpayer funds and and document and 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 facilities. I was asked. Um, as Governor Glendening was approaching his second term in office, I forgot what year that was, um, 1998, I believe, um, by um, someone who was in the governor's press office. We were looking at it because the, the first election was a very close election, and we thought the second election was going to be very similar. And they were going to say, well, you're a state bureaucrat. You've been here for a long time. If you're sitting here in front of a Republican governor or Republican-appointed secretary of planning, how would you define smart growth? And I think I surprised him by saying, I I don't think I would have a problem. Because ultimately, from the state's perspective back then, smart growth was a way to allocate um, funds in an efficient and equitable manner. 
In other words, we only had a certain amount of money to go around. How do we, you know, we don't want to be chasing growth and development. We want to make use of our monies uh, in a way that, that reached the most people and, and benefited the greater number of people. And if you start putting it in that way, um, and I won't use the word conservative, but it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a, a program or, or an approach to growth and development and supporting growth and development that could be sold as a very conservative and fiscally responsible way of managing things. Now, I don't know that a lot of Republicans look at it that way, but, but that, that would have been my approach. And, and four years after that, I had the, the opportunity to sit in front of a Republican-appointed Secretary of Planning and try to make those points. So, you know, it, so it's a question of livability, community design, an efficiency of, of of public investment and 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 you know and, and question about how we're going to live our lives in the future. Well, it's interesting when you think of it in economic terms because if you flip it, part of what you could say is a lot of what we have been doing is not smart growth. Mm-hmm. And if you break that down to the economic impacts, then you can start to say why have we gotten behind in our infrastructure? Why are roads congested? Why are schools overcrowded? What is it about the way we've been doing it that has not been economically efficient, and so we've not been able to maintain? If, if if infrastructure to match those needs. So we've set the table a little bit here, and uh, we've got a lot more to talk about. This is Kai Hagan with Eye on Our Community, and we'll be back in a few minutes. today with Jim Noonan and Matt Edens, and we've uh, started a conversation uh, a little bit about smart growth, uh, what we've done well, what we haven't done so well, uh, what we maybe ought to be doing differently, and what we're going to need to be doing in the future to really make growth smart, <laughs> efficient, uh, sustainable, and supporting our quality of life and, and uh, thriving economy and all, all that that means. So obviously, it's an inherently complicated subject. But just before we went into the break, uh, I just took a little spin off of what Jim said to note that uh, what we have been doing hasn't always been so smart. What we've been doing has a lot of different reasons from you know the market to planning and zoning changes to uh, just doing things the way we used to do them, all sorts of other things. But I think the average person in Frederick County and elsewhere who uh, lives in a community that's growing can identify individual things that maybe haven't worked so well. Maybe their uh, kids' schools have been overcrowded or they can't walk to their elementary school or they have to get in a car to go everywhere or when they get in a car the traffic is almost always bad whether it's shopping at the local mall or commuting down the road to work Um, it's easy to think of these things as inevitable but in fact they don't have to be they can be not as bad or they could be maybe not a problem at all if we were approaching things right so maybe we could take a couple minutes to talk about some of the things we've done that you know, maybe we understand why we did them. Uh, maybe we've done them too long. Maybe we never should have done them in the first place, but that haven't been so smart or that led us to this problem. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I was thinking about during the break uh, on your comment. I remembered it was something I read the other day on, I think it was the Strong Towns website. Mm. It was a piece looking at uh, particularly kind of the economics of a lot of failing or struggling suburbs and suburban towns and part of it was and they had an example it was just like a a random snapshot of you know a a typical stretch of a road in in a suburban area there was like you know a a little strip mall a little you know self-storage place kind of your typical yeah yes you can you can find many examples like that around uh around frederick county and then they went through and looked at, but look at all the infrastructure that's there. You've got this, you've got this four-lane road with a turning lane with, 
you know, all the traffic signals and the sewers underneath it and stuff. And it was like the amount of infrastructure to support the tax return that they were getting off of this very spread out development, the amount of, I guess, dollar per footage or whatever that they were getting back. It was, it was no wonder these places are struggling because they can't generate the revenue to pay for the upkeep of the places of, of what they have already built. And that's beyond the price of building it in the first place, which mm-hmm. is yeah. very yeah, expensive. Is. Yeah, I love the Strong Towns uh, site because they, they view, uh, they view um, smart growth and, and efficiency from a, from a very economical in an economics perspective, not not just a design perspective. Though I think we need to focus a lot back on the design issue, and that's that's important to me. I I, I want to follow up on 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 Matt's point because I think that's that's very very important to understand. Is that when people when local governments pursue um, growth and development, they also look, they always look at it as a revenue generator. You know what kind of revenue is it going to bring? Bring in they'll they'll actually give large businesses tax breaks to to try to bring in jobs to the community. But when they extend infrastructure out to the periphery of the community or out into the countryside, uh, what they don't look at ever it seems is is the long term economic costs of that maintenance and 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 keeping that infrastructure up and in place. So what what smart uh, strong towns describes it as a sort of a Ponzi scheme, I guess, you know, or a pyramid scheme. You know, where you you get an immediate benefit, and that's all great and good, but you you have this long term responsibility that that is forever. Well, eventually the note's going to come yeah, due. The, yeah. the note comes due, and you've got all of these areas where you have to maintain that infrastructure, and there's not enough growth than to to keep bringing in to maintain what you already have and you're still chasing the new growth out with the same infrastructure. Right. I've, I've actually thought that Ponzi scheme, and he's written quite a bit about that, and he's got the one key piece and some other pieces. And, and by the way, for anybody who's listening and is interested in more of this, Charles Moran and Strong Towns, they're on the web, they're on Facebook, strongtowns.org, I believe. Uh, uh, but just look for Strong Towns. They're out of Minnesota, but he travels all over the country and studies these issues. And really, uh, he's a Republican, conservative mm-hmm. uh, planner who uh, looks at this as Jim said, from an economic uh, point of view, and has really gotten down into the weeds for how much this costs uh, and what it's going to cost to maintain it. And, and really, when you read that, Ponzi scheme is an almost perfect description of, of what it is. I thought it doing. was. And, and if you understand, uh, not just in a small community's perspective, from a, a state perspective or even a national perspective, uh, you look at the road building emphasis of the Eisenhower administration, the interstate system, you know, roughly within a 15 to 20 year period, the, 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 the interstate system went from a concept to almost completely built, frankly. And, and what we're looking at now in Minnesota and, other in, and in Maryland is all of the infrastructure we built in that same time period, the, the maintenance costs and, and the, the shelf life of the infrastructure. Only, the infrastructure only has a certain length of time before it needs to be fully maintained or replaced. The, we now have replacement costs for the interstate system that are equal to or greater than the original cost of building it. So when you look at the use of the, of the Highway Trust Fund and that kind of thing to maintain that system, to bring keep it up the thing, you 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 start to understand why we don't have money to build a whole lot of new stuff. Even, even assuming we should do that, right? We, well, we, and that's we don't a have question. the money that's to right. do that, and and that's why you know we start to focus on other infrastructure investments that hopefully um, and, and historically have demonstrated that they can support uh, larger populations in a more efficient manner. And well, and efficiency is a key point there because if the goal has been to provide roads to get people who are now living 30 and 40 miles away to jobs that are far from their house, well, if you think of that as the goal, mm-hmm. that's one thing. But if you think of the, the goal as how do you plan communities where people don't have to travel that far and when they do, they can get their less expensive mm-hmm. in a system that costs less in tax dollars to build and to maintain, mm-hmm. you start asking all kinds of different questions, not only about the form of transportation, but about the way you design communities yeah, which and gets where you, you put them sorry. and everything yeah. else. Which and gets you back to the smart growth issue. Right. Yeah. right. Exactly. And you, you don't have to 
I think density scares a lot of people, but you don't have to be the the benefits you get from density. It's it's a uh, the the way the curve kind of ramps up. You don't have to get that dense to start seeing some serious advantages from it. I've seen I forget where I've seen the the statistics off the top of my head, but um, but just to give you an example, when uh, I guess. A couple months ago, I wrote a piece for the Gorilla where I was looking at uh, looking at that same tax return issue I was talking about earlier. Uh, if you look at the uh, the Walmart out on Gulliford mm-hmm. Drive, right. its uh, assessment for property taxes is uh, twenty one million dollars. Sounds very impressive, right? If you take the footprint of that Walmart and its parking lots and drop it on downtown Frederick, you've basically got the area between Patrick and 2nd Street from Court to Maxwell, I believe. A lot of businesses. A That's lot a lot of, of businesses. It's offices, not, it's, but it's, it's mostly two and three a right. few four-story buildings, so That's it's not right. that dense. Right. Um, and it also includes, sorry, uh, I believe, three churches and the seat of county government. So there's a lot of property there that's off the tax rolls. Total tax assessment for that chunk of ground was about $48 million. Right. Uh, and and I've not, not been a fan of a lot of what the the... Maryland Department of Planning has done the last couple of years, but and that gets to be really geeky technical. But but one of the things they have done that's really good is they've got a staff now that is trying to take use that kind of uh, use computer graphics and 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 other kind of technical um, work to demonstrate the the efficiency of of higher density or at least compact growth and development in an mm-hmm. urban environment. They did a, a study uh, for the city of Salisbury that um, that I think should be a template. for When they looked at redeveloping um, a couple of the, uh, the, the surface parking lots that are right down, right outside of the downtown, and, and did computer-aided design that showed three or four-story um, commercial development, mixed use development there, and the square footage and the and the floor area for that development was the same as as for the Salisbury Mall, which mm-hmm. has a footprint of something like eight times out of, of Much that of which area. Is parking, yeah. And so so all of a sudden you've got you've got <laughs> exit um, ramps. <laughs> you've got people coming to downtown, hopefully living and and working and living in downtown, the very very nice environment, the way they. They described it, and the existing downtown of Salisbury is very nice. Uh, and, and there's there's a there's a stream with a walk area, uh, very close to that. And all of a sudden, you've got this environment that that is utilizing public infrastructure that's already in place, uh, making use of of land that's available in, in the urban environment in a much more efficient fashion. Uh, and that's that's a much and 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 showing the tax revenues that would come to that development that are equal or greater than what's being done in some of the suburban shopping malls, which and clearly yeah. that's got to be part of making the case because mm-hmm. when we come back we're going to talk a little bit about the fact that it's about more than the economics, but the economics are compelling on their face, and that's money that could go to other public services or not be taken as tax revenue in the first place, and, and so it's it's not, and, and when you look at the cost of these things, I mean, we've got a lot of people in Frederick County who worry about uh, expanding 270. I don't know how many of them realize that it would probably be, you know, five, six billion dollars just to do that once, not, not on, much less to maintain it. So we'll be back in a couple of minutes. This is Kai Hagen. I'm here with uh, Jim Noonan and Matt Edens talking about growth and development issues, and uh, uh, we appreciate your interest.
Welcome back. This is Kai Hagan with Eye on Our Community. We've been talking about growth issues and smart growth in particular with Jim Noonan and Matt Edens. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to make sure that we focused on, because I think it's very important that we've made the point, and even though it could be made much more extensively and in much greater detail, uh, about the economics of poor planning and how much it costs to do things badly and how much financial resources are therefore not available for other things, how much more it costs to maintain those things. But I think one of the points that's really important to make is that we're not talking about how do we have just avoid those costs and do things more economically efficiently, but trying to draw the connection between doing those things more efficiently and overall quality of life indicators, right? Because smart growth is about walkability. It's about uh, open space. It's about having adequate infrastructure, not just roads and, and uncrowded schools, but local parks and, and uh, safe sidewalks and all of that. So, if you're doing things in a way, one of the things that I think is most important to convey about smart growth that is smart, that is economically efficient, well, if you design it well, if you plan it well, it isn't automatic, but if you design it well, you're, you're also doing something at the same time that it's freeing up resources, is developing the kinds of communities that people, that are more attractive, that are more sustainable, that offer a wide variety of other values and benefits that people uh, want and appreciate in their life. And uh, so maybe we could talk a little bit about that, uh, that, you know, some of these other elements, because I think we could talk about the economic part for days, and it's an important point to make, uh, especially to people who might not understand that it is actually more expensive and more wasteful to do things a lot of the ways we've been doing them. Yeah, I think one of the things you, you, you need to do, and maybe people in general should do it, is to, to think about what kind of communities they like to spend their free time in. Where do you go on the weekend? You know, do you go to uh, a suburban shopping center or do you go to a downtown with a lot of uh, options, uh, both in terms of shopping but uh, – recreational opportunities, entertainment opportunities, uh, even uh, a friend of yours, Ked Benfield, for example, uh, wrote a, a piece one time ago about the value of a good local pub to <laughs> to smart growth, and especially if it's in a walkable a and, bar. walkable area so you don't have <laughs> yeah. to drive home afterwards. Those things are important to people, and that, those are elements of design that are important to smart growth. So when you're looking at a community that really doesn't have that yet, the question for that community becomes, how do I generate that kind of interest, that kind of uh, um, atmosphere where people are living downtown, there, there are, there's activity after dark. I think you said something about uh, not, not having an empty street. You, drive, you, you know, it's not a ghost town after dark. How do you generate that kind of interest in your community? That's really at the core of, of smart growth because what it does is that it makes those, those kind of communities attractors for other kind of growth and development. Now, that that brings its own issues we can get into later, but that's the core of what we try to do, not only in large cities like around the Inner Harbor in Baltimore, but in still smaller but large communities like Frederick, but even even more so in some of our smaller towns. You know, how do we get how do we get a community focus around a sense of place? Well, an interesting element of that, if I can flip that one too, mm-hmm. is to say how do we get to the point before we can get to bed we have to perhaps stop doing some of the things that have made it hard to plan well i know matt has written a couple of times i believe about uh some of the ways in which the things that we want are not allowed or that our current zoning uh (laughs) makes it harder to do the right thing and so yeah when jim said uh the mentioned the the corner pub i was like it crossed my mind it's like oh yeah can i can you imagine the fight if somebody proposed that in your standard subdivision? Right, right. <laughs> right. It's true, but, but I think you know setbacks and uh, yeah, um, we we parking spent, requirements. We spent a couple generations. You know, we we ask ourselves. You, you look at a place like and, and and Frederick is, I guess, fortunate, and we have like in downtown Frederick, we have a very successful, vibrant 
center you know community like that that we can sort of point to as an example but i don't think people figure you know, why did we stop building places like that and one of the main reasons is that for a couple generations we made it basically illegal to well, build places like that but why did we do that i mean that that <laughs> gets that goes to the core of the question i mean the the history of planning, and especially mm-hmm. zoning uh, theory in planning, was to separate uses, to spread it out, because we were reacting to yeah. um, what happened in the late... The Gilded Age, the robber baron... 19th century, era, yeah. you know, and Industrial all the... Industrial uh, pollution. You know, when, when high rises really were the slums, you know, not... They weren't million-dollar condos. They were places with, you know, that you wouldn't want to live in, yeah, and, and they were Tim right next houses, to the factories. Yeah. <laughs> so, in a sense, it was very walkable and very high-dense, but people reacted to that because, you know, the te- either the technology or the sense of design wasn't there, that those mm-hmm. areas weren't livable. So, it isn't a question of just mixing uses and and density. It's a question of how you plan it out, how you design it, how you preserve the environment in an urban setting, right. you know, or, or important issues to make places livable. And or even and, in what some people might consider yeah. a suburban setting or right. a small so town setting. The so suburb- we're, you know, we're not just well. talking about you know, the middle of Frederick or Bethesda or even Washington, D.C. or Baltimore, but how do we plan the new communities and the new neighborhoods that are uh, on the edges of our existing uh, communities. I mean, in the last few years, uh, the city of Frederick has added thousands and thousands of home to its pipeline and its inventory of future development. And most of that has a relatively familiar, you know, kind of suburban mm-hmm. uh, design aspect. There are some differences. There's a little more effort on, you know, to have mixed use and things like that. But in terms of connectivity and economic viability for public transit options and walkability to schools and and also many other things, we're still not we're not getting there. We're learning, but we're not learning fast enough. I, I think there's more and more uh, effort now to to deal with planning and, and zoning issues, especially in a, in a core downtown environment, from a from a design perspective, more of a marriage of of the planners who deal with the the intricacies of setbacks and floor area ratios and those kind of things, with the architects who and and the mm-hmm. landscape architects and the environmental community right. to try to make that a little bit. Well, we know a lot more than we used to go. We know well, that hopefully you know, every generation we know are, a little bit more. Uh, but I don't yeah. know if that we prove that very often. Well, we don't but, always implement it as quickly as right. some people learn it, because uh, you have a lot of forces at play. The way we've always done development, the, the zoning laws and and uh, mm-hmm. building codes and parking ordinances and things that are in place and that are not always easy to change. It is interesting, though, that that um, that the the. Adults who the the young adults now moving into the marketplace are are focusing on uh, living in what we might call smart and uh, more of a smart growth environment and, and 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 communities now and that's that's a trend we need to get out in front of and right. encourage with with regulatory Absolutely. streamlining and and good design ideas to make sure that keeps happening. And I've heard um, some people describe it as well that's just because they've got a lot of college debt and and uh, the you know jobs are tight right now but I think there's a lot of other evidence to show that this is part of a long-term trend and that the communities that yeah, it's understand not, it's that it's not just economics it's a lifestyle right. choice. Mm-hmm. And you've written about that in mm-hmm. a number of ways I've and I've seen you share and other to articles. To the to the point that it's becoming the development community is i don't know whether the planning community is going to get in front of it or not i think a lot of the smart players in the development community are i mean they're they're investing money in one you know if you look at like the dc market a lot of the development there is going into redeveloping suburban areas into more uh denser more walkable uh urban more urban types of environments and uh and that's market you're driven. Even, yeah, and you're even seeing a little bit of that in Frederick. I know the uh like the uh, market square development across from uh, Wegmans up off of uh twenty six there. I I always kinda chuckled how they uh a lot of their flyers were kind of selling it as downtown living. And I was yeah. like, you know, some 
couple of miles from downtown. Well, that, it's also that's, separated by a very big strode or yeah, wide. Right. So you're, now well, I know yeah, what you meant yeah, by that, strode. Oh, but, that interchange <laughs> is a night. That that intersection is. is a nightmare. Mm-hmm. But 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 I th- I think that that market driven demand for for that kind of growth and and the idea that the development community is recognizing it is important for years the argument against smart growth was that the marketplace for especially for housing would not support it and you can't do that because people want what was then called the american dream which was suburban housing and you're not going to get developers to build this yeah now after the collapse of that suburban marketplace Yeah, the market is really being driven towards this other lifestyle thing. You even see it in television advertising. Oh, for sure. For sure, which you never saw before. Mm-hmm. And in sitcoms yeah. and everything else. In sitcoms else I've and everything seen. else. Um, I've read somewhere, and I've used this a couple of times now, now that uh, uh, that that a whole paradigm is shifting. And, we, and planners, though we're supposed to know the future, don't have a good crystal ball either. And we need to recognize what that change is and get in front well, of it. Well, there are always things we don't anticipate. I mean, who anticipated the Internet 10 years ahead of time and it changed everything? So, uh, Or gas prices or any number of other things that make a big difference in the end. So this is uh, Kai Hagen. I'm uh, here with... Uh, Jim Noonan and Matt Eden uh, talk about growth and planning. This is Eye on Our Community. Thank you for your interest, and we'll be back for our last segment in a minute. Welcome back. This is Kai Hagen with Eye on Our Community. We've been talking about land use, planning, development, uh, you know, smart growth, really, what that is a little bit. Uh, and if you haven't gotten the impression by now, you may never, that this is a very broad and dense subject that we could talk about for a long time. Um, one of the things that I want to make sure we do talk about a little bit is, or at least make the point, and that is, you know, sometimes we will say, well, you know, I live in Emmitsburg or something like that. How does it affect me? What's happening in Urbana or Frederick? And I think it's really important. We, you know, we're we're county government. We're a school, a, a unified, a single school system. Uh, we commute through those areas, but. When we plan and, and develop in a way that is extremely inefficient from an economic point of view, that provides way too much investment for too little infrastructure for the population served and costs far too much to maintain without also getting the benefits of some of these other quality of life elements that come along with better planning, that affects everyone in the county. It affects the tax dollars that it's going to take to build and maintain them. It's going to, it affects the, the tax dollars that it's going to take away from other, you know, cultural amenities and social services that might otherwise be made available to the community. It's going to affect uh, uh, the school budgets and school crowding you know, throughout the county. We are all affected by that. I think one of the reasons that growth and development is such a big issue in local elections and we go, we talk about the pendulum going back and forth is because really it affects everything. It affects our county budget, our taxes, our quality of life, the communities we live in, the commute that we make, the schools that our kids go to, and uh, many other things, you know, indirectly, but substantially. Um, before we wrap up the last segment with some additional conversation, I just wanted to give a sense from one of many um, lists that are out there about smart growth principles. If you look up smart growth principles, smart growth va- values online, you'll find many different lists they're not all exactly the same, but they are all mostly overlapping and c- include a range of different considerations. And I, and I think it's important to at least list those because I remember when I was a county commissioner, I was on the planning commission, you know, having a land use attorney for a developer argue in favor of a a, a sprawling, well and septic single family home community on a farm 
uh, south of Urbana near Sugarloaf Mountain as smart growth and infill because it happened to be a farm that in a landscape of farms was between two older, smaller, uh, well and septic single family home communities. So uh, when when they can look at you that way and tell you that that's uh, smart growth or infill, it clearly means we need to learn a little bit more, talk a little bit more uh, about what that really means. But the smart growth principles on this website, and it's one of many I could have picked, but it's uh, smartgrowth.org, and they have a lot of good resources if you want to take a look at it, is mixed land uses, uh, taking advantage of compact building design, creating a range of housing opportunities and choices, so different sizes of houses, ownership, rental, different kinds of streetscapes and neighborhoods, creating walkable neighborhoods, Uh, fostering distinctive, attractive communities with a strong sense of place. And that gets into some of the things we were talking about, about how design, it's not just about density and location, but it's about design. Um, Preserving open space, farmland, natural beauty, and critical environmental areas. I don't think anybody would argue that those all relate to our sense of our community, what we love about Frederick County, and overall quality of life. Strengthen and develop direct development towards existing communities. And we've talked about how that affects the cost of infrastructure, reduces sprawl, permits more access to amenities and facilities. Uh, Provide a variety of transportation choices. Uh, If you're in an auto-dependent community where you have to get in your car to do anything uh, whatsoever, uh, you may wonder what how it might have been done uh, differently. Uh, make development decisions predictable, fair, and cost-effective, and encourage community and stakeholder collaboration in development decisions, which relates to the process that we use to get to some of these things. So that's just one list, and there are others, but they you know involve a range of things like that, mixed use, transportation, environmental concerns, quality of life indicators. So how do we get there? How do we get... How do we uh, broaden this discussion enough to get the people in our community to understand that maybe some of the things we've been doing for a long time and may seem even traditional uh, aren't working that well? <laughs> well, that's th- how to get there is is, is the sixty four thousand dollar question. You know, I, I think there's still a lot of discussion about that, and there probably is, will be for a long time. There are a number of efforts the state of Maryland has made over the past few years to address those principles. They, we, Maryland has its own set of visions, which are, you know, uh, were really originally developed as uh, out of the Chesapeake Bay program or an effort to preserve the Chesapeake Bay uh, back in the 1980s. But they they have they have evolved or were in parallel with the the. The group of programs you just mentioned. I I thought it was interesting that the, the Maryland is is viewed along with Oregon and a couple of other places as as the leader in in smart growth and you know in trying to implement these kind of things. And yet we still have the same problems that that Virginia has or or Pennsylvania has. I mean we we've we've incorporated smart growth into our local government and our state government lexicon you know we all talk about it mm-hmm. but we don't necessarily have any greater understanding than than others do uh, if you look at the emphasis of the state on transit oriented development for example in the state uh, that's that's important to us and we need to move ahead with that but we're light years behind the commonwealth of virginia that doesn't have a statewide you know a smart growth program has done fantastic jobs at the local government level of, of focusing around transit development so how to get there is you know once you've agreed on the principles how to get there is really an important question i i don't know that we have a clear answer we're still developing policies well we know we're not going to get there all at once right well, so we're going to have been to, trying for 20 years right, too but we're going to you know we're going to go in fits and spurts and we're going to figure things out in phases but hopefully the the big ship turns around slowly at least hopefully it's turning around um you know in frederick county we have a challenge because and an opportunity because we're we were far enough out from Washington, Baltimore, to not be uh, completely developed at a time when maybe the development would have been particularly inefficient or expensive in the long run. But we're close enough in 
So we still have a lot of development pressure, and the importance of doing it right is going to be very important. It certainly helps to have people like you writing about it, Matt. But oh, well, thanks, Guy. <laughs> well, the thing that gets me is, you know, like you said, you were saying, you know, you were using the word tradition a minute ago about you know the way we've traditionally done it, and when you think about it, that tradition doesn't reach back all that far. Mm-hmm. No, that's I mean right. most of. You're talking about for particularly planning, for zoning and planning and things, a lot of those things really first started getting laid down in the 1920s and early 30s. And sprawl didn't really start happening until post-World War II. Yeah, it was a lot of the, a lot of the ideas were kind of right. percolating or formulated in the 20s. And, and as Jim said earlier, that was kind of, that may have been during the break, it was a lot of that was sort of reaction to the massive industrial growth at right. the end of the 19th century. But I think a lot of it is we need to get back to the the older tradition that we have of, you know, the way a lot of smart growth is about kind of rediscovering, re-embracing kind of the way that people have, we've traditionally built for hundreds, thousands even of years. There's a, there's a quote, there's a Jim quote. Jim Kunstler quote I use from time to time in, in writing. Dangerous thing to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's, a, he's a little bit of a gadfly, but yeah. I like this one. Um, we're never going to save the rural places, the wild places, the scenic places, until we identify the human habitat and make it so attractive that people will want to live there. Mm. Cities, right. Right. towns, neighborhoods, villages. And if people are going to live there, of course we want it to be a a high quality of life with Mm -hmm. as many of the positive elements as we can muster instead of seeing it like a a challenge, as it Mm -hmm. were. But I like your point that tradition isn't really very traditional, that uh, a lot of what we've talked about is the way things are, the way that they've been, is something that didn't even exist until after World War II and, right. and even later in the 50s and Matt 60s. Matt Edson, Jim Consular, one of the things he pointed out, and I've, I've, I've loved the, the references, he, he looked at the movie, it's, yeah, you're all familiar with It's a Wonderful Life. It right. shows mm-hmm. up every Christmas time. Well, the bad town. About 200 it, times every Christmas. Yeah, the bad town the is bad actually more town, interesting. You go into there and there's a light. Now, it's a lot livelier. Than, <laughs> the uh, police are nasty and the bartender was rude, but but, but, but everybody's lot, downtown and having a great, good, great old time. And, <laughs> and, the, and the future, that the, the good future was... I forgot the the main character's name. You'll forgive me for that. George but, Bailey. But, yeah. George George Bailey was selling suburban housing. Yeah. This was about 1949. That's so you a really could, funny you could see in that yeah. You could see in that what the future was going to be without really knowing how they were going to get there. And I, I think now we're seeing what the future could be in, in television and in commercials, what the future could be for us if we don't get in its way. Yeah. You know, well, we and that is, it. unfortunately, we're running out of time here. And I, I would just point out that, that is that is one of the things that you know we have to remember. There are a lot of different ways that the future can unfold, and we have choices. And we are not going to make those choices well if the citizens and communities are not involved in that process, which is why all those smart growth lists all include some one or two elements that are about process and about civic engagement and about people being involved. But in order to do that, they have to sort of make some of these connections because when people say it's what the market wanted, sometimes I want to say, you know, the market might have done different things if we hadn't been providing huge subsidies at the time and a debt on the future uh, for how we did, you know, did those things. Now, getting the community involved is one of the core principles of of, of ethics codes for for planners. If you're an AICP, and I know people will know what that is, a uh, member of the American Institute of Certified Planners, one of the ethic core ethics is is how do you um, in your daily work, encourage community engagement. And I think but we're understand gonna, that's a two-edged sword. Sometimes uh, abs- you won't get what you want as a planner if you. Well, you any group decision-making that. process is going to be more complicated mm-hmm. than somebody just making a decision. Right. But it might be a much better result in the end. So, uh, 
we have absolutely, definitely proven that there is way more to talk about here than we have time for today. Uh, I really do appreciate both of you uh, coming here. We are going to be talking about some of the specific elements of this many times over the course of the month, hopefully, over the course of the months to come, hopefully in ways that all of you will find interesting and relevant to some of the issues that matter in our community. So thank you very much for joining us. This is Kai Hagen with Eye on Our Community, and I'd like to thank our guests Jim Noonan and Matt Edens. Uh, We will see you uh, on Monday with our first uh, live show.